So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along and thanks for being here. Um, and you probably all, already also saw my dog. Uh, actually, he has been on more container days than most of the employees of our company. Um, but who am I? Uh, hi, I'm Mario. That's the other dog. Um, as uh, we have quite some animals. You can find me on uh, Twitter or how it's now called X uh, with M. Farland. I'm working for Kubernetes as a Kubernetes consultant and I also am the Google Developer Expert uh, for cloud, uh, one of the Google Developer Experts for cloud and organizer of the Google Developer Group in Munich. So if you ever are in Munich, uh, come visit us for our yeah, con uh, meetups. So we are here to talk about putting a data center in a suitcase. And as you can see, it's not a suitcase. I'm sorry. Um, why, why would you do something like this? So there are different use cases that we, that we will look in, into the, in the end. But um, when you look at the cloud native world and the cloud native space, the, there's a process moving ever more parts into not so usual locations, like you need to move it to, to edge locations, um, and you need to utilize like um, smaller energy that you have available. Uh, we have some environments where we need to cope with outages of energy, and uh, so the infrastructure needs to be self-sufficient uh, self and um, stay around. So we need something that is really low in energy, con energy consumption and really, really portable. So the idea is build everything inside of a suitcase. So we go ahead and say, like, let's use something that you would normally not use inside of a data center. So ARM processors are not the standard that you would use uh, for, your, for your servers. Um, but they are very capable of achieving what you want to do. So uh, the idea is that we have a ton of small ARM, uh, ARM units, or not a ton, but some of uh, ARM units that we can utilize for our cluster building. And uh, we also utilize open source projects like KubeWord to virtualize those CPU cores that we have on those ARM processors. So what are ARM processors? Who of you is using an ARM processor? I'm wondering why not everyone is showing their hands, because ARM processors are in every single phone. So every one of you is potentially using an ARM processor. What are ARM processors? ARM processors are short for advanced GRIS machines, and um, they are utilizing the, the RISC architecture. RISC architecture basically means that it's designed that any instruction that is being sent uh, is executed in a single clock. So this enables us to make it uh, every operation really, really predictable, and um, so we can easily uh, we can easily foresee what's going to happen, uh, vice versa to uh, CISC when it comes to complex complex instruction sets. And there's also a difference in the licensing model. Uh, regarding ARM, because the ARM holding um, licensing the architecture. So, if you are a producer for, if you want to produce ARM, uh, ARM-based processors, you are basically buying the license, and then you can do more or less whatever you want, which is really, really cool. And um, this also gives us the uh, ability that more companies go into the market and develop special use cases or special built ARM processors for certain jobs. So we have it for IoT, uh, we have it for different environments. And also, um, there are already a variety of cores available that you can utilize. So we have Cortex cores for high performance applications. We have Cortex R uh, cores for real-time systems. So there's a big, yeah, a big, 
possibility that, to, that we can utilize different architectures there. Also, a bonus is that uh, since we are also now moving to 64-bit uh, technology instead of 32-bit, uh, um, we, uh, we can add more memory to those processors, which makes it more feasible in the cloud-native world. So it makes it more approachable in the cloud-native world to use. So there are benefits and downsides to ARM processors. Um, the, more, the biggest benefit, as you are all of aware of, is energy consumption. ARM processors use a lot less energy than uh, classical x68 uh, uh, architectures. So we can utilize this in, a, uh, in our portable data center because we don't have so many, um, so many energy requirements and we can use it with batteries and stuff like this. Also, the costs are way lower because it's not li uh, the, the licensing model is, is so open that we have multiple manufacturers. So they are they are the cost for each of the uh, for each of the processors is way lower than you would have with classical um, CPU and memory. And also the the good thing is that you have like those hardware customization. So you can basically build ARM processors for the very specific case that you need, or you can find a company that builds it for you. However, as we are in the cloud-native world, there are still some challenges to this, whole, to this whole environment. So what we still need to think of is the compatibility. So not every software or not every piece of software that is available can work on an ARM processor because it's specific for uh, the, it's, so it cannot work with ARM, with ARM technology be, below it. Also, the performance per core is way lower than to a normal, uh, to a normal x68 processor. So there is always some downsides. And we have another issue, which is standardization. Standardization, as we have so many options now, there is, the standard is, let's say, open, and we need to migrate. So we need to migrate our old applications um, to those ARM architecture, which adds another layer of complexity. Yet. And something that, might, uh, that some people might not recognize is vendor lock-in. If I buy a specific ARM processor from a specific company because they designed it the way that you have it, you're vendor locked in. However, there are the benefits in our case are bigger than the, the downsides. So uh, I went ahead and basically uh, bought a board um, from Turing Pi. There was a Kickstarter like last year and they shipped it finally this year. And uh, it's basically a mini IT export where you can put four, uh, four computing uh, modules on it. I mean, in the end, you can use any ITX or any any board that supports that supports uh, ARM technology. Why I choose the Turing Pi is it's for lazy people like me. Um, the laziest part is networking is already inside of it. There's a, there's a firmware optimized to it. It has storage slots built on it, and there are some there are like a lot of features inside of the board that are just helpful, that helps you to, to build all of this up. There are also like luxury, luxury features like you have a SIM card slot. So internet, you can basically t uh, directly put it onto the board. And the good thing is also when we have a look at our costs, it is not very expensive, right? So. Um, this is what I actually paid, and no one sponsored me, so I'm not, I'm not advertising any of the companies here, but this is what I actually get uh, paid. In the end, uh, the most difficult part to build this was basically the shortage of the Raspberry Pis uh, half a year ago. And I think when we, when we need to see it from a, from a private project that you would do at your home, but rather uh, from, a, from a professional setup that you, uh, when you go into, into industry standards, uh, having 
a running Kubernetes cluster or maybe even more than one Kubernetes cluster for uh, on hardware that you can uh, that is portable for under a thousand euro. This is something that can really really compete with any and with any of the big vendors, right? So. Where's the suitcase? The suitcase, as I said, is there. And um, the demo, I wanted to show you basically how it runs, but I crashed the firmware yesterday evening. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, let's, let's skip the demo part. However, what is the basic idea? So as we, say, uh, as we see, we have four computing modules on it. So the first computing mo uh, module will be our control plane. And now all of the people will say, oh my god, are you crazy? This is not a HA control plane running. So if it fails, it fails. But given the circumstances where we're in, I would say this is, uh, this is a downside that you can agree on that it's okay -ish based on the use case. I mean, you can always use another board that has more compute units on it and then use three nodes as HA control plane and then have your worker nodes. And you can even taint the, uh, the control plane nodes that your workload also goes on, on there. However, what we added, or what I wanted to add there is I wanted to give the possibility to run stuff that cannot run inside of a container so that we have the possibility to have also like vanilla VMs running it. Because as we all know, based on the different world scenarios, um, I talked to, uh, uh, talk to people that said like, yeah, we have some software that probably in the next 10 years will not move out of VMs and cannot be containerized. And you always have this workload with you. So, what I, uh, so the idea is that we utilize this Kubernetes cluster that we put on there and we install kubeword on it, and then with kubeword we can basically utilize the possibility to spawn VMs inside of this cluster with, uh, yeah, uh, with our kubeword um, hypervisor. Who of you have used kubeword or heard of it? Ah, it's 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 getting bigger. It's getting bigger. So kubeword is the idea behind kubeword is that we basically utilize uh, Kubernetes to create VMs, and in those VMs we create uh, cont uh, containers that are basically our, no, uh, in Kubeword we create uh, our VMs. And it's there that we run containerizable software and non-containerizable software inside of a cluster. And they officially say it's not a hypervisor. I like to argue about this topic, but um, let's let's just not say that. Yeah, you can use it as a hypervisor, but we will do exactly this. We will use it as a hypervisor, and the good thing is that we can also now use traditional, yeah, traditional uh, virtual machines as well. But before we get the Kubernetes cluster on there, uh, before we get Kubernetes on the cluster, we need a cluster there. So, um, and like the previous speaker said, uh, some dirty self-advertisement. Um, we have at Kubernetes created an open source project which is called Cube One, and Cube One is basically um, a tool to install and update and uh, manage your Kubernetes, uh, a single Kubernetes cluster in a declarative style. So we basically follow the Kubernetes principles on how you could create a cluster. It's 100% open source, and uh, it just uses uh, vanilla Kubernetes. And the idea is basically it's for your lazy people that don't want to install clusters with kubeadm, like me. So I just used Cube One and installed my cluster onto this, uh, the Raspberry Pi. So basically, as you can see, it just runs various steps in it and adds, hey, we, this is the control plane, and those workers will join, and then it installs everything for you, and you don't have to take care of the other stuff. And because this is a container conference, and Kubernetes is an, uh, is an important open source project for us all, some service announcement that you might have missed 
tomorrow, like literally tomorrow, there is going to be a freeze for the old legacy repositories for App Kubernetes IO and YAM Kubernetes IO. So any release that is further going, beginning of tomorrow, will ne no longer go onto app.kubernetes.io. So please check uh, check your um, your setups, check your uh, ch check your local uh, registries that you use now the new address, which is packages.kls.io. So this is something that everyone should uh, should change. The good thing is, if you're lazy like me and use Kubernetes, we already patched it on Friday. So <laughs> just use the uh, the Cube One uh, release that we had. All right, but back to the topic, uh, back to virtualization. So Cube World uh, has an ARM integration, which is nice. It uh, the good thing is that basically. It supports a lot of various platforms, so we can utilize Raspberry Pi, NVIDIA Jetson, Snapdragons, and so on. And the cool thing is, you can also put on this board uh, Jetsons, so you can uh, also put TPUs on uh, and GPUs on this. And there's a wide support for different OS systems that you can use. And the good thing is that with the QWERT API, it's very easy for you to manage both. So you can manage, uh, manage ARM-based uh, VMs, and you can also manage x68-based VMs. So this makes it easy to prepare and test for moving over to a complete ARM um, structure. The problem is there's a little bit less performance with KubeWord for, uh, for ARM. And also, the documentation is flaky. Let's put it this way. And it needs some digging and some support to, to get around it. Also, you're now wondering why I potentially have a little bit too much overhead. I mean, when I add KubeWord on it, I lose some performance of this cluster. So I, I'm limited, right? So I have 4, 8, 12, 16 cores. So this is a limited meta. There are other, there are other uh, uh, modules that you can put on that has more cores. However, the good thing is that we can basically uh, go ahead and see what would be the overhead that we lose. So um, for sure, the KubeWord controller and the API server of KubeWord will consume some resources, but this is neglectable. The virtual machine overhead, you will have nevertheless, because if I create a virtual machine, it needs virtual machine, right? Um, also, uh, we use, uh, in our KubeWord uses libvirt and uh, kiemo, so this overhead is there, but it's not a KubeWord-based overhead. It's just a virtualization-based overhead that you have. The cool thing is that what we can use is we can use overcommitment. So we can spawn a lot more VMs than we actually have cores because of the overcommitment uh, in, in KubeWord. Also, what you can do is uh, we have the resource allocation, so we can basically limit the resources that KubeWord itself takes, right? So when we, when we now have a look at everything, it, be, it becomes clear that we have like our, our data center up and running, and we, can have, we, have a, we have a running Kubernetes cluster. We have the possibility to spawn Linux VMs. We have the possibility even to spawn Windows VMs on this. I would not recommend it, and why should anyone do this? But we know people do stuff with Windows. And we do this with a very, very small fingerprint. And as you can imagine, as I already said, everything went splendid. There were no errors. Everything was great from the beginning. No. The theory that I, how I built it and how I thought about it was, yeah, this should be easy. This is really, this is really easy to do. This is really easy to fix. However, there are so many errors you can run into. So the first, the first error that I ran into was using a USB 2 cable. Because it's a USB 3 slot. And if you use a USB 3 slot and a USB 3 slot and have a USB 2 cable, 
it doesn't work. And it took me some time to figure out that I only have a USB 2 cable. Um, the hard things to debug was uh, missing packages, because we have on all of these nodes, I have uh, Ubuntu installed, and the problem there is there's, for certain Ubuntu versions, there are some missing packages for ARM support. So you don't have any drivers, and things don't behave like they would behave. The next thing, the next error that I made was basically buying the wrong Raspberry Pis. Because I bought Raspberry Pis with EMCC storage, which basically removes the possibility to have um, any SSD cards on those. So 130 euros per Raspberry Pi, poof. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I managed it un, uh, to flash the EMCC storage and then use the EMCC storage, but this was not the way how I wanted it to be. Also, on this board, there are NVMe slots on the back. So you have, for each of the nodes, you have the potential to add an NVMe, uh, NVMe SSD. However, this is not supported by Raspberry CM4 modules. So Another, another possibility gone. However, now I could use the SATAs, uh, the two SATA ports, but the problem with the SATA ports is they are only working on node 2 and node 4, so you need to basically create your own storage server, have your own storage server up and running, and uh, this also takes more overhead, right? So you're losing, uh, you're losing a lot of performance there. So I'm now waiting for the new computing modules that Turing Pi itself released, which is pretty nice. They are eight cores and 32 gigabyte of memory per, per module, which is pretty, pretty cool. And the price point is also reasonable. We are like 220 euro per, per module. And the next thing that, that came up was um, I had the wrong network configuration. And the worst fuck up was yesterday evening, patching firmware. Never, never change a running system. However, um, where would we go from here? So where's, where's the way ahead where we want to, uh, to land in the end? So one idea would be, which is a little bit ridiculous, but to have a multi-cluster running on this. So we already have our cluster where we have our virtualization. And now we can use, on top of this, um, other products for, for multi-cluster deployment. So we could use self-advertisement, sorry, uh, KKP, which is a multi-cluster uh, multi approach so that you can basically, uh, con you have containerized control planes, so I don't lose too much overhead for my, for my single nodes, uh, for my single clusters, for their control planes, because they are all running in containers, and I can spawn multiple containers. And the cool thing is that we basically can say our machine stack has two machines, three machines, and we scale it down to zero. And based on what use case we currently need to fulfill, we have just clusters where we just spawn up the amount of nodes. So the, you have multiple clusters where you can switch between clusters based on the need that you currently have. Also, the next thing would be bring in a portable power source. So have like a small... Um, photo uh, PV thing where you use solar power and solar energy to take it around with you. Also change the pies to, as I said, the, uh, the, Turing, uh, the TPM modules. Or uh, the next thing is doing a stress test. And what also comes to mind when we go into the, into the future, when this sh should become like a standard or a product that we want to hand out, no one wants to do to install this manually per hand. So the next steps would be using Pixie Boot, just plug in a network cable and uh, install the whole setup with the help of Tinkerbell potentially. So these are various steps where we where we can go ahead and go further into this direction. And as promised, use cases. What is what is the use case for this? So a use case for such a small device could be something if you are in the research department or if you go on to uh, expeditions and stuff like this and basically want to directly calculate your found data. You can, you can take this, it's carryable, you can move, uh, have it in all, over, all over the world. 
and take it with you. Also, small sites. We are getting more and more to the point where we, read, where, where we really need compute power in stores or in vending machines or in, in stuff like this. So these are, these are possibilities where such a small cluster, also with such a small energy print, could be utilized. Um, and the bad thing, and, but the bad thing most times gives the money, is military military usage. I mean, there was uh, there was in the uh, in the war uh, between Ukraine and Russia. You you probably saw the news that uh, Ukraine captured like containers of of the Russian uh, intelligence where they had their uh, their servers in it and so on and so on. And if a soldier or an intelligence soldier has this in his backpack, it's way easier to move one man than to move a whole container, especially in a battlefield setting. So this could be also something where, where like those small clusters could be used. However, we hope that we don't use the military uh, idea first and the other, uh, the other ideas. So uh, thanks for the fish. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> Really well done. Um, that I think you're our only speaker that brought props, but you know the time's not finished, so we'll <laughs> see if someone else comes with something else. So uh, we have received some questions on Slido. Um, are ARM okay. CPUs production ready from software compatibility perspective? Um, so from uh, when it comes to the Kubernetes space. They are. They are support. They are tests implemented. They are running ARM tests uh, for each of the Kubernetes releases, which, by the way, costs a ton of money. Um, so the support from this side is there. Uh, I think the most critical part is currently um, getting your own software supported uh, on, on ARM CPUs. Cool. The next question is, USB 3 is backwards compatible to USB 2. Was there not enough bandwidth, or was the cable not capable to provide the necessary power? The funny thing is, it should be backwards compatible, but um, for whatever reason, and I actually debugged it together with the, the Turing Pi team, they said they are using some parts of the, uh, of the bandwidth that USB 2 cannot deliver. Because it's basically uh, why you why I needed it for the, the USB 3 cable was basically only because I needed to um, flash the EMCC storage inside of the um, inside of the uh, of the computing units, and there was the problem that uh, you basically install your whole Ubuntu via USB. Sorry, Matt. Yeah. At what point should you switch from local hardware back to the cloud? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think anything that uses a lot of computing, like uh, anything that goes into uh, data and uh, machine learning, data analytics, uh, stuff like this, should be, uh, should be done in the cloud or at least in your data center because the, the, the hardware is good enough there and the performance-wise it makes more sense. But anything that needs to be there immediately and locally can be run there. And there's basically the, the difference uh, between going into the cloud. And I would, I would put cloud and my own data center on the same level. What benefit do you get by the virtualization layer? Why not use containers on bare metal? Uh, the virtualization layer is uh, exactly for because not everything is in a container. So I have stuff that cannot run inside of uh, inside of of a container. So I need a VM for this. And then we get to the point noise neighbor. If I would directly run the stuff on the bare metal, um, I, I cannot control it. Right? It's it's on the on the on OS of the node. So if something goes goes wrong there, it basically would kill my node. If I run it inside of a VM, it's safe. Right? I can just kill the VM, and the the system is not affected. And the last question is, how was the persistent storage solved? Seth. 
So there's Ceph, uh, there's Ceph running, and um, currently I use the, S uh, the two S8 ports uh, on the nodes, and there's a Ceph server. And uh, on the other hand, uh, if the NVMEs are supported, then you can basically just use the, on the, the, the node storage on the node itself, on the nodes themselves, sorry. That's all the questions we received on Slido. Does anyone have any last minute burning questions live? Yes, it's on Slido, probably too late. Uh, yeah, I, just, I was just asking about the, like, if, the, if the hardware breaks, is it likely that only one of the four, com uh, one of the four compute unit br units break? Or yeah. does, it, does the whole board usually break? Uh, no, uh, also, uh, for me, um, the, um, I needed to exchange one of the pies because it died. And uh, because this, there's nothing persistent on the node, right? Because I had the, the S ATA, um, nothing changed. I just changed the Pi and everything continued to run. But I mean, this is not production ready, right? So this is not something that I would now put into <laughs> a car and <laughs> and rely on on there. So uh, we we need still to, or there's still a lot of things to figure out. But it is uh, I. I would put it as an idea into your heads to these are approaches where we could move in this direction to utilize small ARM clusters on, in, in certain environments. All right, let's give one huge round of applause for Mario.